This is a little mini harp right at the end here, yes. And so this is the one that Natalie copied for the student Rose Mooney harps. And this one here, the, 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 fourth, the fourth one along, is the Muller Mass harp, which they caught here copied for our student Muller Mass harp. And these are the only two of these models that we've had got up and running. So we don't really know what the other three are like to sit at and to play and what kind of voice they might have and what their musical possibilities might be. So yeah, Barbara's working on the Kill Bear Hub. And there are people who've worked on the Sir Harp and had copies of it made, although I personally have never seen one. But I don't think anybody's done any work on the, on the Hollybrook Harp. And it's a fascinating instrument. It's really elegant. Its, it's sound box is not hollowed out from a single log. It's, built, it's, it's made from planks. Yeah. Not like a modern harp, it's made yeah. from planks yeah. in, in an old style. So it's just a little bit different. Oh, well, this is a thing that somebody else commented on as well, that the old harps, I would say, are a lot more slender and subtle than modern copies. Even good quality replicas. If you look at the copy of the Cloyne harp, it's much more chunky and beefy than the original components. And so I think that the old harp makers had a real sense of grace and slenderness in, in their work. They, they were very confident in thinning the components to make the harp more alive and more beautiful. And modern makers tend, to, tend not, to, not to have that fineness in their work. And the student harps, of course, are much thicker because they're just very yeah. crude outline. Yeah. 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 You know, there, there's no subtlety there. It's just yeah. to get the shape up and running, to get the strings on it so we can get a sense of what it feels like to hold and sit up. So it's, it's a really important thing in all of our work to think about how fine the old harps are, what quality they are. You know, none of us has a harp of this quality. None of us. We should. We all ought to be playing on harps of this quality, but none of us are. And I find that very interesting and very, you know, you think about this and think, well, what's wrong with our harps? Why are they not as good as this? You know, and his part. Even, even like your Queen Mary. Or oh, my Queen, or? my Queen Mary is way below the the, the, the the standard of artistry and the real thing. I mean, I've taken my Queen Mary harp into the museum and put it next to the real thing, and you look from one to the other, and you go. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. And and I think there's lots of reasons for that. One is the people who made these harps are working in a living inherited craft tradition, like violin makers today. They know exactly what to do, they know what they're aiming for, they have the, tool, they have the tools and the techniques to do it. Whereas heart makers today, they don't know anything, and everything is an experiment, and they're guessing, and they're trying things out. And the other difference is, is that we as harpists and scholars, we don't know enough about these things, and what we're looking for, and what, what they're meant to be like. So when we commission a harp from a harp maker and we instruct them and we ask them to do things in certain yeah. ways, we don't know <laughs> enough to guide them. They don't know enough to just do it. It's all feeling our way in the dark. But every, everyone, every time a harp maker makes a quality replica, every time one of us commissions a quality replica, we learn new things. And so the next person, mm -hmm. their commission can be better. Their commission can be more focused and the work of the maker can be of a higher quality. So every harp that's made should, in theory, be an incremental improvement on the previous one. But it's up to us, as, as practicing musicians, to put the commissions in and hustle our harp makers along. And it's up to our harp makers to knuckle down and do the study and build on the resources that have been done before and get the instruments up and running. I'm just looking at the more modern. That one there. Oh. It, 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 somebody, was it you said something about Burns? Okay, heart? so, so Paul, Paul, is, Paul has his eyes to the heavenwards, as usual. Yeah. And, um, to the shamrock. <laughs> so, so these up, up, up here, in construction and design, are in the Anglo-Continental tradition. This is the colonial takeover of the Irish harp. And the ones on the bottom are uh, real ignored, thing. and this one sweeps in and takes over. But the harp on the right is made by John Egan's nephew, Francis Hewson. And so you remember 
the, the slide with the lineage chart of Owen Keenan to Arthur O'Neill. Arthur O'Neill was the last of the old indigenous tradition, but he was employed to teach the charity schools. And so he had a number of blind boys who he taught to play the harp. Valentine Rennie, Edward McBride, and others. And then after, after O'Neill died, Edward McBride was a tutor at the harp schools. And he taught, Edward McBride taught Patrick Quinn, who we have a photograph of. And he also taught um, Hugh Fraser, who went to Drogheda and taught at the Drogheda Harp Society. So you have generations of blind boys. But even then, it came to a full stop. The, tra the old tradition came to the end, and that was that in the 19th century. But that harp was owned and played by Paul Smith, who was a student of maybe of Valentine Rennie, maybe of Edward McBride. What date? Um, this is about 18, 1840s, that kind of date. So it's after the old indigenous tradition has gone, but there's still a thread keeping it going for a few generations. But even that thread snapped and, and that, it came to uh, end. Patrick, it was a Patrick Byrne, the, the guy in the photograph. Yes, yeah. So we know it's Paul Smith's heart because his name is written on it when he was presented with the heart by the society. So it's just a little interesting yeah. snippet so of kind of like... And the one beside it is, is consciously taken out to refer to the... Yeah. And, and yet it's completely Anglo-Continent. It's completely Anglo-Continental. In, in everything about it. Yeah, yeah, that's decorative, but, but the, musically it's an Anglo-Continental part. The one in the middle is the neo Irish heart. That's uh, characteristic of McFall. It is a Mc, it's by McFall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yep, it's characteristic. Oh yeah, that's, that's like 1910, 1920, that kind of date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, they're, they're using Celtic art, but musically, yeah, yeah. Th they've lost all mm -hmm. this, and they're just going to the, mm -hmm. to the Anglo yeah. tradition for their music. Right yeah, oh yeah. Oh, it's a, it's a well, that's why it's in the museum, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's an it's a iconic revival thing. Yeah. But for us, as, as music scholars, it's, yeah. it doesn't have anything to tell us at all. These but, are, this is, this this is the real is deal. Purely classical, yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, but made in Ireland. But yeah. made an island for the Irish market, but in a totally continental, yeah. But you see, for us, looking at the old Irish traditions, this is, this is where it's at. These are the harps of the old harpers, and the harps of Carol Ann, and that music, and that style, and that tradition. And they're, they're harder to understand visually, because they're older, they're more damaged. You know, this harp is as decorated as any of the ones above, but you can't see the decoration, because the pages have faded, Away. And, and, and is it not, is that, I mean, is it just um, romantic that this is Carolyn's harp, or is there any basis in... It's 100% romantic, yeah. but it's the kind of harp that Carolyn <coughs> plays. We, th we think that this harp belongs to a woman <coughs> harp called Rose Mooney, who was uh, active at the end of the 18th century. Edward Bunting took down tunes from, and her, from her, and we have stories about her travelling and touring. So we think it's, we have a description of, the, of her harp explaining what a quality instrument it was, that it was very sonorous and light. Um, and you can see her smashed to bits at the bottom. It's completely demolished and repaired iron and tape. And I like to imagine that it was such a beautiful tone that when it was smashed, she said, no, I don't want to throw it away and get a new one. I want it repaired and renovated and to keep, to keep its voice going. So I love to see... They had a long working life, you know, they were respected and quality instruments. The Rose Mooney harp is the one to Barbara's left, the, very, the one at the very end. That's, that's the Rose Mooney harp. And you see at the top, it, it has what looks like a scroll at the top. But it's not actually a scroll, it's just circles. Like the, 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 the craftsmen knew about classical scroll, but they didn't know how to do it. They just, it's, it's like an Sometimes interesting indigenous the, the response to new fashion. It's a bit like Caroline's music, perhaps. Yeah. Now the, the, the harp, we, we, we have copies of Rose Mooney's harp and the Mullamas harp that we've had up and running in the house all, all week. Barb was working on the Kildare harp, though I've never seen a copy of it. There are people who've worked on the Sir harp, 
and have made copies of it and got them up and running. But nobody's ever done the Hollywood half, which is the one at the far right hand end. Well, probably because it doesn't have a, a one piece sound box. Yeah, so, it, so it's slightly different to the usual. If sound box isn't one piece, but actually, if you look at it closely, it's a very, very fine okay, instrument. Okay. It's really slender and delicate very, and yeah. shapely. It's a real it's quality like piece of work. Yeah. So I think the Hollywood harp is a really interesting, a really high quality 18th century Irish harp. It has interesting traditionary connections. It's said to have been the harp of Robin Adair of the song. So Robin Adair had this harp and played it according to tradition. And for the wolf hound eating the top of the Yeah, yeah. Um, I look at it and I think it's a bear head. If you look at the drawing in Robert Bruce Armstrong. It, it, uh, with the way the ears go, but I, I can I, it, from this I can see where you think it's a, a wolfhound. But after looking at it, yeah, from this angle, but I I tend to think it's a bear. But um, and and because of the ear and other other views, but yeah, I mean bears were extinct. You know, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, like 500 the, years ago. The, the, the decoration, the, all the carvings on here, it starts out of the mouth of the bear, I think bear, mm -hmm. and it starts with like creatures, like paramecium and weird, weird crawly things, you know, millipede kind of stuff. And it goes up and then at the end you have the head of the queen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, then, and then a beastie that looks like he came from the Book of Kells. Yeah, well, they're all from, uh, they're all from uh, uh, on on Amalia, um, done t uh, top sales. Uh, top sale oh, okay. did a whole yes. thing, and, and they're directly copied from top sale, the, the animals. So okay. um, that that's an interesting. But um, and and then there's Irish language on the harp and also inscriptions in Latin on the harp. The writing was uh, gilded, it was all a uh, gold leaf. Uh, the colors painted bright colors, so this is uh, the, the colorful harp that's a recreation of what it might have looked like. Um, the sound box, the green sound box, um, the first one broke, um, this one was made and they don't keep the harp up to tension and actually there's tension in the neck, but um, uh, it's it has 52 strings on it, uh, and it's Some presumably of them are pairs, are they? well, it, yes, overlapping. So yeah. the rows overlap. It's a guess at the soundboard where the string holes are because that doesn't exist. So it's figured, on, and there's different configurations that can be made, and people are having copies made, but like they want it right-handed to be able to play it with a right hand in the treble, and that's not what it was made for. Yeah. So, and, and I have my own ideas what I might like, but I, I don't play multi-row harps, but man, the tension on this is huge, because um, I, I should actually figure it out. I could calculate what it, what it might be. And, and I mean, if, if one of those strings snapped under that degree of tension, I mean, are they... Could it catch you in the catch you? Or? <laughs> great, uh, a great thought. Somehow it never happens that way. Maybe that's why they sat on this side and kept the strings out of here so oh, you wouldn't get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and presumably that sound box is that shape and that plane because they because they just they weren't going to conjecture about it. Right, and the first one broke, and and it was played though. It, it was played uh, uh, to get it sound, but it. Uh, there's there's a crack in the neck as well too up on and, and the original there's there's um, some cracks showing so there but most of the four pillars here but it, it's really a large low headed harp and a pretty amazing harp uh, and uh, there is a, a man in Germany playing a, a working copy a speculative copy and he's waiting for a really well made copy. Um, it's waiting quite a while. Another, no other harpers. I, I think Siobhan Armstrong would be one who could really play this instrument well. I would like to see the sound box more in the style of, say, the the Kildare sound box, more on that order than 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 like this. But again, it, it's very expensive and and a different thing. So this for. 
a speculative sound box yes, is it's fine. It's, 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 it's yes. just functional. The yes. sound box yes. are purely functional. Yes, yes. They don't really mm -hmm. waste any resources on at, at, music. Yeah, yeah, at, the, at this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they had the Baru harp today, I mean, the whole conservation has moved on so much in the last 50, 50 or 60 years since yes. that harp was cons conserved. Yes, and the first, the first conservation job was really quite poor in the yeah. plaster cast. Yeah. And then the, redone, the redoing of it was better, but I think today, they skewed it a little towards Robert Bruce Armstrong's interpretation of the Queen Mary. And so, yeah. and, and, but I really want them to be studied. I want the, the wood samples to be taken and use dendrochronology, radiocarbon sure. dating. I would like them dated because they've already been, they're not playable. These are, these are like remains. We need their DNA, <laughs> in yes, other words. Yes, yes. And, and there is a full screen scanning and then we know what kind of woods and so we're not, it used to be sheer speculation and, and uh, oh, tradition has willow sound boxes and makers say, oh, that's a stupid wood to use. And, and it took it to trying it and then, oh, really? But it, it, it took the likes of, of me wanting something and wanting a hollowed out sound box, that type of thing, and others to get these instruments made. But without proper research, done, you're sort of throwing money away. Yeah. We, have to, we have to close the harps in, otherwise they'll start eating us alive. Oh my God. Like the bear. Yeah. yeah.